Thank you very much, um, Ben, for both that introduction and also to Ben and Fran and the Centre for inviting me to come here. It's always um, a pleasure and a thrill to get to talk to people about Watership Down, and all things children's horror and scary bunny rabbits. OK. Obviously, I'm here today to think about one specific film and the, uh, a, a film that has a very particular kind of reputation. So um, for those of you who who are able to feel free to use the chat to post about your own experiences, memories of seeing Watership Down. Um, I'm very always very keen to hear hear about those reminiscences um, and I'll catch up with them later in, in the Q&A. So for this talk, I want to start by explaining how Watership Down fits in with my previous work and how I came to study it so closely. For those who may not have had the pleasure, um, in inverted commas, of seeing it or who have not seen it in a very long time, perhaps because of negative experiences or memories, Watership Down is the 1978 animated film directed by Martin Rosen, based on a 1972 novel by Richard Adams, and it tells the tale of a group of wild rabbits who flee their warren when one of them, the clairvoyant Fiverr, who you can see on the screen, has a prophetic vision of its imminent destruction by humans. They find a new home on the titular Watership Down, facing many dangers along the way, including from other rabbits. And just so that we're all on the same page, um, I'll show you a clip of Fiverr's vision that happens just a few minutes into the film to remind you um, of, of what it's like um, and to give you a sense of the film's tone if you have not yet seen the film. So, okay, I hope that wasn't too uh, distressing. So it's because of scenes like this that Watership Down is perhaps now best remembered as the film that traumatized a generation, as was declared by The Independent on the film's 40th anniversary in 2018. Naturally then, as someone whose research concerns the intersections of horror and children's cinema, and who also has a fondness for rabbits, to say that I have a particular interest in this film would be something of an understatement. My work on children's horror began, as Ben just explained, with a PhD thesis, which then became a book, Horror Films for Children. And my approach to children's horror is that I try to resist and complicate common perceptions about horror and children being incompatible, or this idea that horror is inherently a corrupting, damaging, or indeed traumatic force upon children. And instead, I try to highlight the kinds of pleasures and other benefits that horror can offer a willing child audience. And this is also my approach to Watership Down. But despite being remembered as one of the most disturbing children's films ever made, I didn't actually discuss Watership Down in my PhD or my book. And there were many reasons for this, chief among them that it's a British film and I was focusing on American cinema. Although I also wasn't really sure at that time if Watership Down could be described as either a children's film or a horror film. But I will say more about that later. I've kind of changed my tune on both those fronts. Then, as I was coming to the end of my PhD, something interesting happened. And Ben again um, alluded to this, which is that Channel 5 broadcast Watership Down on Easter Sunday in 2016. So Ben, it wasn't just that it was in the morning, it was on Easter Sunday. And apparently so many people complained about this on social media that major newspapers felt the need to report on it, as you can see here. And the responses and criticisms included condemning the choice to show the film in a time slot in which children would be able to see it, as well as questions and queries around the BBFC rating that it holds of you for Universal, um, and which it still held up until August of last year. In spite of this backlash, Channel 5 did the same thing again in 2017, and the whole cycle was repeated. 
Um, to my disappointment, Channel 5 have not continued with this pattern, but the film's reputation as traumatizing continues to circulate online through memes such as this one, which humorously kind of juxtapose images from the film with its popular status as a children's text, um, you know, referring to it as a traumatic childhood experience, etc. And I just want to show in particular um, a TikTok that I came across um, about a year ago, which I think also just really nails this sort of uh, popular status of Watership Down. Here we go. But if you close your emotional vanity, emotional vanity, emotional vanity, emotional vanity. Okay, short, short and sweet, but you get the idea um, that Watership Down is thought of as in these in these terms is emotionally damaging. Um, something I want to pick up on from that TikTok in particular is that Watership Down is an outlier among the films presented. It's the only one of the films shown on that video which was not actually conceived as a film for children. People will often talk about Watership Down as if it was intended for kids by saying, what were the filmmakers thinking making this film for children? But the reality is kind of the opposite of that. The director, Martin Rosen, has said himself, I did not make this picture for kids at all. And indeed, when Watership Down comes up in casual conversation, people will often have a really visceral response and say to me, completely unprompted, that is not a children's film. And the thing is that they are right. It Technically, it wasn't supposed to be. But I, th I think it's such an interesting response because the fact that they feel the need to contest that label kind of ends up applying it anyway. And it's in the context of responses like that that it became very clear to me that Watership Down is a film in desperate need of closer examination. So with my new edited collection, I hope to provide a more holistic and nuanced examination of Watership Down one that considers its popular status as a traumatizing children's film in detail and depth, but which also looks beyond that to think about the numerous other elements that tend to get overshadowed by this reputation. So as you can see from the table of contents here, the collection looks at areas such as the film's aesthetics, both bloody and not so bloody, its production history, including the change in director from John Hubley to Martin Rosen midway through its production. There are chapters on music and in particular, the gorgeous, gorgeous score by Angela Morley, which itself is an aspect of the film that tends to get overlooked and overshadowed in favor of the single Bright Eyes, which I'm sure you probably all know. And there are also chapters that think about the film's increasingly relevant political and environmental themes, as well as its frank and deeply moving portrayal of death. With all that being said, due to my own background, this talk is of course going to focus on the horrific reputation that Watership Down can't seem to shake. Why is it that after 45 years, this film still holds such a strong grip over Gen X and millennial childhoods. What does Watership Down and the cultural discourses around it tell us about the relationship between children and horror? And why do those little bunny rabbits create such a stir? In asking these kinds of questions, I think I am kind of complicit in contributing to this narrative of trauma. And indeed, I got some pushback on my focus on horror in the peer review of the book. And when I posted the details for this talk on a Watership Down subreddit, I was accused of branding it as a horror film and seeking attention, to which my response was basically, yes, please come to my talk. Um, and if you are here, then welcome and thank you for coming. But this sort of defensive attitude to Watership Down is important and valid. It represents a different side of Watership Down's cultural legacy, which is among the fans who saw it as children and found it not traumatizing as such, 
or at all, but profoundly moving or even radicalizing. And there is a really good chapter, um, chapter 14 by Catherine Sadler in the book that represents that kind of um, perspective. These are perhaps people who understandably bristle at what they consider the pigeonholing of Watership Down as horrific or traumatic, and who might see that label horror as a pejorative. But what I hope will be clear from this talk is that when I'm talking about Watership Down as horror or horrific, I really mean it as a positive thing. So regardless of your own personal experience and attitudes to Watership Down, all of these varying responses are valid because this is the kind of diversity that we also see in children's responses to frightening media. Children, just like adults, are not a monolith. They are going to have a range of different experiences to screen media, depending on a whole range of factors, including their own age, their taste, what kinds of films and television they've seen before, and the context in which they watch horror. These are all issues that are raised in um, David Buckingham's book, Moving Images, Children's Emotional Responses to Television, which has been hugely influential on my own work. Discussing children's responses to horror, he says, the diversity and complexity of children's experiences of horror should lead us to question many of the assumptions that are frequently made about it. Assumptions that are often based on ignorance, not merely of children, but also of the genre itself. To be sure, children do often get frightened or disgusted by horror films, but then so do adults. The notion that the experience is therefore necessarily negative and traumatic is no more valid than whether it is somehow automatically therapeutic. On the contrary, the extent to which children find a film or a television program frightening will depend on how they perceive and interpret it and upon the social contexts in which they watch and subsequently talk about it with others. So here I want to extend Buckingham's argument about the importance of context to Watership Down. What are the contexts and factors that led it to becoming known as the most traumatic children's film ever made, despite the fact that it was never really intended for children in the first place? Did it always have this reputation? And if not, where did it come from? How does going over this history alter our perceptions of this film? And how does it alter our definitions of children's cinema may, and maybe even horror? Then I want to consider Watership Down in the generic context of the category of children's horror. Despite my own reluctance to position it in this category in my earlier work, and despite the more general public resistance toward positioning it as a children's film. This is because I think to consider Watership Down as a children's horror film can open up rather than close down discussion of all of the wonderful things that it is and does, including, but by no means limited to, its horrific effects. So, how did Watership Down's horrific legacy come to be? I'm going to start with marketing, um, and one of the other things I commonly hear people say about Watership Down is, I can't believe that was marketed for children. And I really think there is a sense of, like, betrayal when people say this, that they're like, I was tricked into seeing this horrible thing. And I think that's very fair. But also, if we look back at how the film was marketed, that's not exactly um, what happened. So let's return to Rosen's insistence that he didn't see it as a children's film at all. Despite this insistence, he did seem to anticipate that the film would be received as a children's film. After all, the novel by Richard Adams is often classified as a children's novel, although again, as with the film, that label is quite contentious and Adams himself wasn't comfortable with it. There's also just no getting around the fact that animated animals, especially rabbits, come with certain child-friendly associations. In fact, early in the film's development, Rosen wanted to avoid making the film in cell animation so as to avoid what he called the cute and cuddly connotations of the medium in a not so subtle allusion to Disney. The choice to hire John Hubley, an experimental animator, as the director also reflects this intention to distance Watership Down from 
Disney and other child-friendly um, animated films. Although after considering various other media, including stop motion animation, puppets, real rabbits and actors dressed as rabbits, Rosen evidently realized that cell animation was actually the best option after all. So he did try to mitigate against child-friendly perceptions of Watership Down through its production and then its marketing. In 2018, he claimed, I did not make this picture for kids at all. I insisted that the one sheet indicate how strong a picture it was by having bigwig the rabbit in a snare. I reckoned a mother with a sensitive child would see that, a rabbit in a snare with blood coming out of its mouth and reckon, well, maybe this isn't for Charlie. It's a little too tough. So I think actually he's sort of contradicting himself a bit here because he, clearly he does see it as being okay for some children, but you know, not very sensitive or very young children, which is important. In another interview, he said, if parents were unable to determine the suitability of Watership Down for their children after seeing the artwork, I'm not sure what else I could do. And I do kind of feel for him here. I think there is a sense of like exasperation um, coming from these kinds of um, responses. So if Rosen felt that he could, he had done everything that he could to communicate the film's tone and content through this poster and also the trailer, which is similarly intense and you can see it on YouTube. What were the other factors outside of his control that contributed to the perception of Watership Down being suitable for children? One of these was the critical reception. In 1978, British critics almost uniformly characterized it as a children's film. Barry Norman, for Film 78, framed it as a possible half-term outing for families, while The Spectator called it a straightforward children's adventure. Some even found the film to be too childish, with Monthly Film Bulletin saying that it's hard to imagine that there is much here for the adult admirers of Adam's novel. I think it's it can be easy to look at these reviews and kind of think, what were, what, what were you on? Like, how could you think that this was a straightforward children's adventure? But as um, Ben said before the talk started, and as Fran Critchley has pointed out in her excellent MA thesis on Watership Down, this was the 70s and other children's popular culture included folk horror programs like Children of the Stones and bleak animal stories like Ring of Bright Water. So in that kind of context, Watership Down probably didn't stand out. Most critics did acknowledge the film's potentially disturbing aspects with some like Rosen issuing caution that the film might not be suitable for very young children, whatever that means, but no one seemed to think that it should be off limits to children as a whole. And emblematic of this was the Guardian's reviewer who said that it's not true that the film is too violent and disturbing, for children and they compared it with Grimm's fairy tales. Of course, then there is also the matter of film classification and the film holding a BBFC rating of U for Universal, which has been strongly contested, criticized and debated ever since 1978. The U rating, along with cartoon bunnies, is perhaps the key determining factor that contributes to perceptions of Watership Down being a children's film. In keeping with the careful marketing strategy, Martin Rosen was opposed to having the film being a U rating. So again, he kind of pressed the BBC, please don't give this a U, although he was clearly unsuccessful. Um, just to give you a, a quick heads up, the, the next slide, I do have a, a quite a graphic disturbing image from the film. In these slides, I've tried to showcase some of the really gorgeous watercolor background art, because I think that is another aspect of the film that gets overlooked and overshadowed by the reputation of trauma. But I also couldn't help myself putting in just like one really grisly image. So I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's your warning. So. In their original classification report from 1978, the BBFC reasoned that animation removes the realistic gory horror in the occasional scenes of violence and bloodshed. And we felt that while the film may move children emotionally during the film's duration, 
it could not seriously trouble them once the spell of the story is broken and that a U certificate was therefore quite appropriate. So obviously there's a few things that we could critique about this, um, not least the assumption that animation can nullify horror and the predictions about how children will be affected, which clearly did not bear out to be correct. And we, if we compare this report against some of the more brutal images from the film, then we can understand why this classification decision is often characterized as a huge blunder. Although I think to characterize it as such implies thoughtlessness on the part of the BBFC. When I think we could see it instead as a fairly deliberate and calculated decision that was attempting to provide flexibility and inclusivity in what was then um, a less flexible rating system than we have today. Because in 1978, the next step up from the U was the A rating. There was no PG. And the A rating was an advisory rating that we could say is sort of halfway between what we now call the 12A and the 15. So it would have provided the warning effect that Rosen wanted. It would have cautioned parents um, about potentially unsuitable content for children. And it would have permitted children under the age of 14 to see the film as long as they were with an adult. But evidently the BBFC didn't seem to think that the film needed any such warning. And to their credit, they seemed to think that the film holds value for young viewers, a position that I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with. And I'm pleased to say that several of the authors in the collection demonstrate this potential value. So we can split hairs over whether Watership Down's U rating was the right decision. Although it is worth pointing out that the U does not and never has intended to signify that a film is for all children only that it's broadly safe for children to view. And even then, the current BBFC guidelines state that a U film can contain elements of horror, threat or violence, as long as it provides reassuring counterbalances, which Watership Down arguably does through comedic supporting characters like Kiha the Seagull and moments of triumph and optimism. It's perhaps the case then that the problem with Watership Down's U rating is not necessarily the rating itself, but perhaps a disconnect in how that rating is understood by different groups. But whether it is the correct rating or not, the BBFC's decision has undoubtedly helped to establish Watership Down's iconic status. And I have to wonder if we would even be talking about it today if this hadn't happened. The BBFC claim that Watership Down is now one of their most complained about classification decisions, although according to their archival files, at the time of the film's release, they received very few complaints from concerned parents. In response, the BBFC justified the rating by comparing the film with The Wizard of Oz and Snow White, although I don't think that those were the best examples they could have chosen, as they are also notoriously frightening children's films which hold U ratings. A third complaint from a parent did not even take issue with the film itself, but with the trailers that were shown before it, which were for the X-rated adult sex comedies, Confessions of a Driving Instructor and Confessions of a Window Cleaner. I'm just going to open my door because my cat's scratching at it. Hang on. Okay. And I thought it would be the bunnies who would be, you know... Um, causing problems. So if Watership Down was not particularly controversial in 1978, where did this reputation of trauma come from? Of course, all of the sources I've drawn from so far are from people who were adults in 1978, producers, critics, regulators, all making decisions for and about children. Children's own voices are not represented. And I haven't done an audience study on this, that's a remaining gap, and someone else is welcome to do that. But there is such a wealth of anecdotal evidence that I feel fairly comfortable suggesting that it only seems to be as children have aged into adults, that their experiences of the film have been heard 
And this coincides serendipitously with the ubiquity of the internet, which amplifies those voices and, you know, allows them to create memes like we saw earlier. And this is how I think that Watership Down's traumatic reputation has kind of solidified over time. That brings me to one other really important site which is that of television, which is perhaps even more important than cinema in Watership Down's legacy. Television was important for advertising Watership Down in the UK, like on Barry Norman's Film 78 programme that I mentioned before. And also there was a preview of the film on the children's BBC programme Animal Magic in an episode that focused entirely on rabbits. In the US, it also featured in the broadcast of Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And if you go online, you can see pictures of the Watership Down float that was in the parade. But it's television broadcasting of the film itself that I'm really interested in. So there's a growing academic consensus around the importance of television and the space of the home as important sites for children's engagement with horror. And I've listed some of the key works um, on the slide. From the broadcasting of Universal and Hammer horror films in the 50s and 60s, to horror programs specifically made for children like Goosebumps. But also television and home media can allow children to evade barriers of film classification and parental supervision more so than in the context of the cinema, thus enabling access to previously forbidden texts. So thinking back to Buckingham's emphasis on context, it's the broadcasting contexts of Watership Down's televisual life that are important here, as factors like channel, time of day, can tell us a lot about a film's intended audience. Long before Channel 5 showed the film on Easter Sunday, Watership Down already had a long history of being broadcast around major holidays, like Christmas, when family programming is very prominent. And this dates at least as far back as 1985, including one broadcast of the film on Christmas morning, 1990. So if you uh, remember seeing the film on TV when you were very young, it was perhaps on one of the dates um, listed on the slide. And of course, in all of these instances, the film was being broadcast at times of the day where it's expected that children would have been watching. And this in itself frames it as a children's text. Throughout the 90s, it was even broadcast on the Disney Channel, which is very interesting. And I just want to highlight the listing from the Daily Mail here on the slide, which is not only very dismissive about the film, but really unhelpful in terms of helping parents and children assess whether it's okay for them to watch. If you, you'll see the last um, sentence says that quite sarcastically, young children may find the Art Garfunkel theme song disturbing. It's the Daily Mail, so, you know. As I and multiple other scholars have argued, television has the potential to both alleviate and exacerbate children's experiences of watching horror where interstitial content like lead-ins can provide warnings about the program. And if something is scary, you can change the channel or perform other self-censorship strategies. Equally, however, television's flexibility can also remove important context, potentially leading uh, to increased distress, especially, for example, if it's Easter Sunday and you turn on the TV to find a poor rabbit being mauled by a dog or having its ears shredded by another more evil rabbit. I also want to briefly acknowledge the home media releases of the film with a focus on covers from the UK and how these have changed. So funnily enough, or perhaps um, not funnily enough, as Watership Down's traumatic reputation has formed over time, the VHS and DVD covers have become more aligned with dominant trends in the marketing of children's media. The original poster that Rosen intended to warn viewers of the film's content was used for the VHS release in 1982 and 1992. And these also provided fair warnings about the film's content with the 1982 blurb referring to a rabbit holocaust which is not inaccurate. Um, by 1999, however, 
the design of the cover has shifted quite drastically to something more colourful, less dramatic, and which presents a very different impression of the film than the original cover. And this is even more so the case in the most recent DVD edition. So again, it's all about the importance of context. If you watch Watership Down expecting what those later covers promise, the film itself is probably going to have a more distressing impact. Interestingly, the original cover that Rosen carefully selected to warn potential viewers is now only used for special edition Blu-rays of the film, including a release by the Criterion Collection, which positions it not as a children's film than as a collector's item for adult cinephiles. Although I do also just want to shout out um, a New Zealand edition, which someone alerted me to on Twitter. And this is genius, I think, because it's reversible. So you can have Watership Down Trauma or you can have Watership Down the kind of fluffy bunny um, edition. I think that's just genius, it's great. So the point of going over all of these paratexts and the classification and everything is not to ascribe blame to any particular person or organization for Watership Down's reputation or effects on children, mostly just because to ascribe blame would imply that the fact that Watership Down has ended up frightening a lot of children is a bad thing, which I fundamentally don't agree with. Rather, this overview just intends to demonstrate the really complex web of factors that can contribute to the extent to which a film is considered a children's film and how this perception has the potential to exacerbate the impact of a film's content and lead it to gain a certain reputation. Looking back over Watership Down's paratextual and televisual history also draws into question how we define a children's film and how this label is conferred. When people say that Watership Down is not a children's film, what does this really mean? What is a children's film anyway? Ian Wojcik Andrews suggests that this term can mean three different things, films aimed at children, films about children, and films that children view regardless of whether they are children's films. Watership Down arguably falls into this latter category. We might also add to this list that our definition of children's film depends upon the child who is watching. And also to add even more to that, um, when they are watching it, you know, what part of time in history, where, what part of the world, etc., etc. When people say that Watership Down is not a children's film, I suspect what they're really saying is it does not meet their expectations of children's film, and by extension, does not meet their expectations of children. This is where I turn to the second part of this talk, where I think it's useful to think about Watership Down within the category of children's horror. What Watership Down and children's horror as a genre have in common is their defiance of boundaries. And this has been discussed in my work as well as the wonderful work of Philippa and Tunis. Children's horror disrupts boundaries between children and adults, between children's and adult media, and the boundaries and definitions of the horror genre and children's culture. Watership Down in particular also defies our expectations of rabbits. Indeed, I think a significant factor in Watership Down's controversial legacy is that it dares to be a, a children's film that shows childlike substitutes doing and seeing and experiencing things that our culture tends to consider off limits to children. And what creature is more childlike than a bunny rabbit? Um, warning again for some uh, nasty images of, of rabbits. It's precisely this deceptive cuteness that has led both children and rabbits to be treated in adult horror films through a reductive adult or human gaze as either demonic villains to be feared and destroyed or innocent victims to be protected and saved. I'm skipping over a lot of contextual and theoretical work about rabbits and children in horror that's in my chapter in the collection. So you're just going to have to trust me um, on this. Children and rabbits are also often equated with each other, as in the film Celia, pictured um, top right, or in Fatal Attraction, just beneath. 
where horrible acts of violence happen to rabbits as stand-ins for imperiled children. Children's horror films, however, refuse this kind of binary thinking when it comes to children. Children's horror films depart from this reductive representation of children in horror as either victims or perpetrators of violence. Instead, Megan Troutman has argued that animated children's horror films like Monster House rewrite mainstream depictions of children as passive and vulnerable by allowing their child protagonists to engage in violent behavior that seems to challenge the notion of childhood innocence. Building on this, I've argued in my own work that these representations imply an equally subversive or perhaps horrific child viewer of address who is invited to take a diverse range of effective experiences from these films. In this way, children's horror directly challenges historical and contemporary moral panics that children who are exposed to the genre will be inevitably corrupted or harmed by it. Watership Down, therefore, can be considered a children's horror film, despite the fact that it was not initially been in it was not initially intended to be received as a children's film. But the fact is that it has been watched by millions of children and many of those have responded to it with horror. Importantly, Watership Down is children's horror because it depicts a group of rabbits as stand-ins for children whose representation challenges our perceptions of rabbits, children, and what a children's film is supposed to look like. It's actually precisely the way that it, that it depicts rabbits which drew me to Watership Down in the first place and is why I now share my life with rabbits. It presents rabbits as not cowering passive little bunnies, although some of them are. They are also heroic, cunning, generous, loyal, as well as evil fascists. And yes, they can be violent when they need to be. Just ask um, any of the magpies that have visited my garden and tried to start fights with my rabbits. On the slide, you can see a, um, a character sheet used in the production of the film, which showcases some of the diversity of the rabbit characters, including descriptions for personality traits and the build of each one. And you can see this and other behind the scenes artwork in chapter two of the book. On the matter of violence, it's also important to acknowledge that the violence in Watership Down is very much underpinned by moral alignment. And I won't get into details here, but there is a fantastic chapter in the collection by Sam Summers where he lays out that argument. Watership Down also contains a self-reflexive commentary on the spectatorship of horror by children or childlike rabbits. A productive comparison can be made between Watership Down and children's horror film Paranorman, which is a prototypical example of the genre and one of my favourites. Just like Watership Down, Paranorman is about a clairvoyant child who experiences a vision that something terrible is going to happen to his community. Not believed by the authority figures around him, it becomes up to him and a group of other children to avert an apocalyptic disaster. In both films, then, the interaction of children or child substitutes with images of horror benefits their wider communities. This is a stark and refreshing contrast to discourses that treat children's contact with the horror genre as a societal calamity that must be avoided at all costs. We can also see this benefit in contemporary critical responses to Watership Down, such as that of Phil Hode, who, writing for The Guardian in 2014, constructs himself similarly to Fiverr in his recollection of seeing the film at the cinema as a child. He says that he was terrified. Of course he would be. But he says that the experience was a vision of fear that hooked me, first hooked me on the power of cinema. And I think the, that article is really worth reading. It really gets to the heart of the fact that Watership Down is this really visceral and intense experience, but one that many people look back on fondly, um, regardless or because of the fact that it was really intense. Of course, to wrap up, not all children do or will receive Watership Down or other children's horror films in this kind of positive way. But it's precisely that variation in responses that I think makes the film valuable. 
Watership Down challenges our expectations of children and rabbits, and by extension, our expectations of what a children's film can be. It dares to address and represent children and rabbits, respectively, with the complexity, diversity, agency and respect that they're often denied. And by acknowledging that kind of variety and diversity in children and children's films, I think we might be able to take a step closer to ensuring that children who want to engage with Watership Down and the range of emotions that it offers can do so on their own terms. And then I will just wrap up with a plug again for the collection. Um, you can buy it in hardback if you are ridiculously rich and have money to throw away. Um, there's a 35% discount with the the code there on the Bloomsbury website, which probably still works. I haven't, I don't know, it might have expired, but either way, you, you should probably just get it open access anyway. Um, you can download the ebook completely for free and legally from bloomsburycollections.com. So please do take a look and thank you so much for listening.